Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna wait just a second before things get started. Um, while we wait, if anybody has the chat window handy, would you mind just typing hi or hello just to make sure that you can hear me? Okay, looks good. I'm seeing highs from Anne and Evan and Ben and Noah, so thank you so much. Um, just real quick, as you can see, um, my name is Becky Bernard. I'm the Marketing and Recruitment Director for Pavlis Honors College. I've got a couple of people here with me tonight um, that will help me tell you a little bit more about Pavlis. Um, the first thing that we'll do, though, is run through a little presentation. There's a lot of different things about the Honors College to talk about. So um, I'm just going to run through that, and then we'll talk to the people that are actually working with Pavlis and uh, doing the honors program every day. Yes. One person is still waiting to get in. Oh, okay. Let's see. So it looks like we have one person that's still waiting to get in. So we will admit them. Okay. We will share the screen and get started. Okay, so thanks again for joining us tonight. As I said, my name is Becky Bernard. I'm the Marketing and Recruitment Specialist for Pavlis. I'm going to give you a quick overview and then uh, get talking to my friends that are here with me tonight. So, let's start out with the differences between Pavlis and other honors colleges. Traditional honors programs focus on depth of study in one specific thing. So if you're a mechanical engineer, you take advanced ME classes with other MEs and learn more than a, than a general ME class. They also have a minimum GPA requirement. So if you drop below, say, a 3.57, then you're out of the honors program. Pavlis, on the other hand, is a little different. We focus on breadth of study and some other out of major skill sets with opportunities to learn more about your major if that's what you want, or about something totally different if you have multiple interests. It's also a chance to work with other students and faculty from multiple programs. It's really hard to find a career when you're going, where you're going to be dealing exclusively with people in the exact same field. You need engineering and management and human resources and all the other divisions to work together. So we want to start giving you those skills now. And of course, the third part, which surprises a lot of people going in, Pavlis doesn't have a minimum GPA requirement to get in or to stay in. And here's why. You're going to be a Michigan Tech student, so we know that you're smart enough. We know that our curriculum is already advanced enough. So we would rather have you try new things and take advantage of new opportunities than play it safe and avoid risks and get a 4.0. Earlier, I mentioned that the focus was on breadth of study instead of in-depth in major skills. Pavlis does this through a group of skills that we call the honors abilities. Be authentic, build relationships, be open to new experiences. On first glance, these look a little abstract, but we decided on these areas of focus after talking to industry leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, lawyers, health professionals, and academics in all paths of their careers and across the globe. But still, it's kind of hard to imagine yourself going on a job interview and saying, well, I'm an honor student, so I know myself, and thinking that that's going to be a great reply for a recruiter, and we get that. So you'll learn the theory behind the abilities in your classroom in three one credit seminars, but this is how you'll put it into practice. You could win venture capital funding through one of our many uh, funding campaigns. You could uh, present undergraduate research. Or you could travel, whether it's on study abroad, an internship away, or just volunteer work, or just for the experience. So the honors program is designed to work with your degree program and comes with some benefits. We're going to start long term and work our way backwards. So this chart is an example of the traditional uh, way that careers have worked. You spend the first 25 years of, or so of your life learning. Infancy, K through 12, apprenticeships and college. Then you go to the workforce for the next 45 years or so. You'd stay in one industry or even with one company and gradually work your way up the ladder. You'd retire at 65 and hope you'd get five good years in before you went to the next big adventure in the sky. The chart at the bottom 
is closer to what the current employment, employment model looks like. We're jumping back and forth more and more from learning things to leveraging that information and then building an eventual legacy. So for example, you're learning about robots in second grade and then you engage with mind trackers when they come to your class. The mind trackers get you more excited about the field. So in junior high and high school, you learn throughout the year and then engage with first robotics and a few summer youth programs. You learn more in college and engage through internships and study abroad. You engage in your first career after graduation. And then you need to learn more maybe after a few years as technology changes or as your interests change. Maybe you get an online master's or take some seminars about new technologies. And when you retire, you don't fully retire. Maybe you don't sit at a desk at 8 a.m. anymore, but we're seeing that our retirees are taking second jobs, doing more volunteer work, and providing consultation services to share what they've learned, which is great because it cements the legacy of what, what they've learned and means that they can stay engaged as our lifespans get longer. The new way of working is exciting, but it also means that you should never stop working and that you have to know what's going to be best for you and your future plans. So, this is something called Keegan's Theory of Adult Development. Um, we know that employers and grad schools want people in stage four, where people are agenda-driven, problem-solving, and independent. Only 2% of college seniors get to that point, and only 35% of adults will ever get to that point. That is where Pavlis steps in. We know that Pavlis gives lifelong benefits, but we also add value during college. You can customize your curriculum to your interests. You get experiences that are more than one line in a resume. You're a member of an incredible, caring community. You receive honors recognition on your diploma and transcripts, and you'll walk away with leadership, agility, and growth mindset skills that will help you in your career and in your outside life. Okay, so let's say that you're interested in, your honor, in the honors program. You're here tonight, which is great. How can you get involved as an incoming student? We use a lot of different terms around Pavlis. Our honor students are on a pathway. You're potentially a pre-admission student. I wanna take a couple of minutes to help you differentiate uh, between the terminology before we go on. So let's use a metaphor to describe this. Let's say that we're going on vacation to Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park, excuse me. So a traditional degree program is like saying, let's follow the park map that the Rangers gave to us. Much like following a standard map, our degree programs are designed to give you the best of the best. You need to see Old Faithful when you go to Yellowstone. You need to take Chem 1 for most of your classes at Michigan Tech. Um, in the end, you'll walk away more than happy with your experiences and your, and your memories. Um, it also fits needs and expectations. While Yellowstone needs to get 3 million people through their park every year, Michigan Tech graduates need to keep airplanes in the sky, cell phones running smoothly and securely, and financial portfolios growing and they need to get these skills in about four years. Like a well-marked, busy main trail, our degree programs keep things running smoothly with no backtracking. So the Pathways program is say, like saying, let's follow up the park map, but focus on something that I really enjoy or I'm really curious about. Um, you plan your time so that you can spend some of your weeks doing the things that you love and making experiences that are unique to you. You'll follow the same main degree path as everyone else in your major. But while they're maybe not as organized in their electives and their activities, you'll know all the good places to explore and you'll have other people around who want to do the same thing. Our pathways are like areas of emphasis, things that we see our students tend to be passionate about and want to dig deeper into. Leadership, community engagement, undergrad, undergraduate research, enterprise, or entrepreneurship. Or if they like all of these things or none of these things and create their own pathway, that's an option too. We usually call it the custom version. The pathways, uh, we've constructed our pathway program out of what we know our best students do. The honors program works concurrently with your degree, so we won't ask you to miss out on in-major classes or add time to your stay at Michigan Tech. As much as we would love to keep you, we know that time means money. We also don't ask that our students do more, we just help them get more out of what they do. The only piece that's exactly the same for every student are three one credit course seminar courses that teach you about the honors abilities and prepare you for the other, other pathway components. Academic enhancements help you take advantage of the intellectual breadth available on campus and complete your mission. 
Immersion experiences give you the chance to apply knowledge in context outside of the classroom, like an internship, a co-op, a service ex experience, or an international experience. The goal is to look around, look around and learn not only about the place that you are, but about yourself and how to prototype possible futures. The Honors Project is pretty broadly defined, but it, it should be something of your own creation with an end product. You could do research and present at the Undergraduate Research Symposium, identify a change project for campus, or develop a way to improve your enterprise team. Leadership and mentorship helps give back to the community and share your knowledge and expertise, and cements your legacy. The results are, again, like going on a really good vacation. While everyone else has the same photos and the same stories about Old Faithful and Buffalo and creating a senior design project, still amazing, still impressive, you'll stand out because you have stories about the time that you pulled off on a little known hiking trail and saw a grizzly bear and made lifelong friendships and learned leadership skills and built a nano satellite that was launched by SpaceX and toured Facebook, Google, Handshake, and HP and more in Sil Silicon Valley. It was an amazing vacation and I'm starting to lose this metaphor, so let's keep going. So finally, pre-admissions. Uh, much like a trip that can't start until dawn, you can't start on the full Pathways program until you have sophomore standing. So instead of sitting and waiting for time to pass, pre-admission is a way for you to prepare for the trip ahead. Uh, first and foremost, it's a way to acclimate. This is going to be a big year for you. You're going to be starting college at a new school, probably in a new town, and meeting new people. Pre-admission lets you make friends for your new journey and teaches you the basics of the honors abilities before you really dive in. It's like going for a 10 minute walk in your new boots before you go on a 10 mile hike. Pre-admission also helps you develop a map, a map for your future in Honors 1150, which replaces UN 101 and is literally called Create Your Own Path. Uh, there you'll connect with older students, faculty, and staff and learn about the honors program and get off access to opportunities like talking to heads of industry, writing research papers if you choose, and more. You can also live in the Pavlis Living and Learning Community, or the Pavlis LLC. Uh, if what we've talked about interests you, things like following your passions, meeting people from outside of your major, and making the most out of your time at tech, consider living in the Pavlis LLC. We have two halls on the ground floor of Wadsworth Hall that have been set aside for first year honor students. Uh, we'll be talking to a few residents in a couple of minutes, but if I can brag about them for a second, we started this community this year. Um, other than Honors 1150 and connecting a few times a year, like on move-in day and on Halloween, we've stayed pretty hands-off. We wanted the LLC to feel like home instead of being 24 seven honors content. And they've built this incredible hall that's incredibly kind and incredibly social without it feeling like it's mandatory that you hang out with the group all the time. Um, I'd actually originally wanted to do this web webinar from the kitchenette, but that's the heart of the community and we didn't want to interrupt the study groups and the hangout time that just kind of naturally occur there. Um, it's an awesome community and it's won awards and it's, we're so excited that we can do it again next year. Um, so if you're on the fence about becoming a pre-admission student, I would say give it a chance. Um, apply for a pre-admission, take honors 1150, and if you'd like, stay in the LLC. If you do all of that and don't want to continue on your pathway, that's okay. We would rather have you explore the program and take some skills with you and not continue than be 90% of the way to trying it and, reg and regret not actually doing it. Um, so we are going to get to our students in just a second, but um, in case you're interested, I wanted to make sure that we covered this too. So. If you'd like to apply for pre-admission, go to mtu.edu slash honors and click for incoming first year students. It'll take you a little, it'll take you to a little bit more information about pre-admission and also a link to our application. Um, all we'll need is an essay and a reference. The deadline to register is March 25th. Um, if you're interested in staying in the Pavlis LLC in Wadsworth, especially, I would say um, if you could submit before the 25th, it's going to be on a first come first serve basis to get people into rooms. And uh, we've seen a lot of interest in it for the next year. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and introduce you to a couple of people. Um, so I have Elise, Jordan, and Anderson. Um, if you all wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Elise Teeny makins um, I am a recent alum. I graduated this past May, um, and I've been spending 
um, my gap year before I start medical school um, this coming fall at Michigan State. I've been spending that gap year working for the Honors College, so now I've been a student in the Honors College and um, now an employee for the Honors College, so I've seen it from both sides now. Um, and I majored in biochemistry here at Michigan Tech, and um, I was in the custom pathway. Hi, I'm Jordan Zeiss. I am a first year here at Tech majoring in biomedical engineering and I live in the Pavlis LLC and I am a pre-admission student. Hi, my name is Anderson Lind. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. I am one of the RAs in the Wadsworth Hall Living and Learning Community. I am a second year management major and I'm currently involved in the research scholars pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's start big. What made you decide to join Pavlis? <laughs> um, so when I was first applying to tech, I got this little slip in the mail and it said, hey, we think you'd be a good fit for Pavlis. Um, and I wasn't sure what it meant at first, but I wanted to try all the opportunities that I was presented. So I, had, I applied to Michigan Tech with one of my friends. So I also applied for the Honors College. And ever since then, we've kind of been keeping each other motivated and focused on our goals and tablets. Uh, I applied for or got interested in Pavlis um, mostly because of a scholarship that was run through the Pavlis Honors College. Um, and so I learned about it from there. And I thought that it sounded really cool and that it would help me enhance my academics and get more out of my college experience than just taking the classes that was prescribed for my major and I thought that that was really cool. Um, so Pavlis has changed a lot in the time since the the time that I started in the Honors College um, and that was four years ago which is actually crazy now because I do not feel that old. Um, but yeah, I applied during my second year. There was no such thing as pre-admission. Um, when I started in the Honors College, I applied or it was, I guess it was the, the um, spring of my freshman year and then I started during my sophomore year. Um, and um, yeah, I got interested in um, Pavlis after I saw something on the website um, and my mom had also seen something on the website and so she encouraged me to apply. Um, she had been an honor student in college, um, but I, I don't think she knew at the time that this was such a different honors experience. Um, but she encouraged me to apply, so I did the video application, um, and I started um, seminars during my second year. Um, and I was originally, um, I didn't know a lot about the Honors College coming in, um, but I knew that I wanted to challenge myself, um, not just in academics. Um, so, yeah, I kind of went in not knowing what to expect, um, but being okay with that, um, which is one of the honors abilities, embracing ambiguity. So um, what do you like about it so far, or what are some of your highlights? Um, so I haven't been in it very long. I'm technically still not actually in it because I am just a pre-admission student, but I really like just the community that it has. Just obviously I live in the LLC, so that's a big community, but even just within the Honors College, there is a lot of community and people just know each other and go, oh my god, hey, how's it going? Like just around campus because they know each other from one of the honor seminars that they took together or just like seeing each other around during some honors event. And I think that that is really cool. I can go next. Um, so yeah, I've had a lot of experiences in the honors college, um, especially now being a student and on the other side, um, seeing all the things that go into um, the experiences that the Honors College creates for the students. Um, but my favorite part of it is definitely the people. Um, all of my seminars have just like been filled with such amazing people that have taught me so many things. Um, and it's a really nice um, space on campus to kind of get away from all of the stress of um, really hard like science and engineering classes. Um, and just to really like come together as this like really loving and supporting community. Um, and especially one of my very favorite parts is all of the mentors that you're surrounded by in the Honors College, whether it's older students um, or the advisors and the professors in the Honors College, the instructors. Um, there's just so many people um, that are there to help you. 
um, and part of the Honors College is constantly networking with those people um, and forming new connections. So that is definitely one of my favorite parts. Like these two have said next to me, uh, <laughs> my favorite part is probably the community. Um, as an RA, I got to see all of my timid little freshmen come together and um, <laughs> form like, these amazing bonds in just a few short weeks. And knowing that most of them got connected through the um, introductory 1150 class, but have continued beyond like acquaintances to become really close friends, is, it's really cool. And I mean, every week I'm seeing different people hang out with each other and you just, you get to know so many people through Fabulous. It's, it's really cool. So Jordan, as one of the former timid little freshmen, I think, what were you expecting about the LLC and what has kind of, kind of become a bit, or have there been any surprises? Do you see anything different about the LLC versus other halls? Anderson, feel free to chime in too. Um, so I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, I knew that I wanted to, so, I'll start, my roommate and I knew each other before we came to college. So we had been talking and we were like, do we want to live together in the LLC or not? What do we want to do? Um, and my roommate was kind of like, I don't know about the LLC. That seems like a little weird, but I was like, I think it'd be fun because I knew my, my sister, I have a twin sister and she goes to University of Minnesota and they also have LLCs of their own. And she had heard a lot about LLCs at the University of Minnesota. And I was like, that sounds kind of cool. It kind of forces you to have a community, even if you don't end up being like best buds with everyone in the community, like you are, are automatically have some sort of connection with everyone there. Whereas right, living in like a regular residence hall, you might not, um, except that you live on the same floor or whatever. And so I, told my room and I was like yes we're doing this this sounds awesome and I can tell you that she now fully agrees it is awesome <laughs> she's very glad she did it um but I came in and I was just I didn't know what to expect um but and so one of my big worries was like am I gonna be able to make friends am I gonna be able to like form connections with the people in the hall because like we're a such a wide span of majors and yeah we're all freshmen but like that doesn't mean that we have the same interests or anything like that. Um, but I, my closest group of friends is formed from the people in the hall. Um, and so I did not have any trouble with that. And it was very nice because I was able to form friends in outside of the hall in my different classes and in my orientation group. But then I also developed this really close group of friends in the hall just based on like sitting in the kitchenette and working on my homework and all the other people who sit in the kitchenette and work on homework and whatever and so I think that was my main concern and then that entirely is not a concern anymore which I really like and I don't think I would have gotten if I was just living in a regular hall rather than the LLC or gotten as much of <laughs> yeah, I can agree with Jordan. I've uh, I've got friends in other halls, but when I mention that a lot of my residents or whenever I'm hanging out in the kitchenette, it's uh, usually greeted with a look of bewilderment because not a lot of people will hang out in their kitchenettes in their respective halls, or if they have friends, they're from their classes, or it's just their roommates' friends. Um, so being able to see all these different people come together. And like you saw in the uh, Happy Holidays picture, we had, I wanna say 25 people who participated in our Secret Santa. So it was like, uh, we just had so many different people kind of come together to all have fun. So I think it's a really unique experience that honestly everyone should try. <laughs> And from what I've seen and from what you all have said, it, it seems like it's sort of a, you drop in and you participate when you want to and you're able and, you know, if you're having more intense week or you're just kind of feeling like a little introvert time, it's not like mandatory that everybody has to be in the kitchenette every Friday night by eight o'clock. It just seems like drop in, drop out, do whatever works for you and there's going to be somebody around no matter what. Mm -hmm. It seems like. Yeah, we, there is a, like, 
a group of people that generally spend most of our time in the kitchenette. So like any time that we have not in class, we're probably, or not sleeping, we're probably in the kitchenette. Um, but there are some people that aren't like directly in that group of people that will sometimes be hanging out in the room, doing homework, whatever, at class, sleeping, or they'll come into the kitchenette just for a few minutes. Like it just, people can just drop in, do whatever. And we do have like organized hall events, um, like going to hockey games together, watching a movie together, stuff like that. Um, but it's not at all required and you can or can't do it if you want or don't have time or whatever. Um, and another thing that a lot of people do is they just leave their doors open. And so like they'll be sitting in their room, but not necessarily in the chaos that could be in the kitchenette. And, but they, you know, still might want like some social interaction. And so then they leave their doors open. And so then people might stop by and be like, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, whatever. And so you still get interaction with each other. It's just not as crazy as the kitchenette can sometimes be. Sounds like occasionally you can use it as a learning center when you don't yes. want to walk all oh, the way yes. to the learning center. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I've seen, oh, sorry. But I've seen a lot of people uh, come in there for different classes that a lot of them might have all together, whether it's um, Calc 1, Calc 2, or Chem, or Physics. Um, there's usually like the few nights before the next big exam, you'll see more and more people kind of show up in the kitchenette or uh, just hanging around campus together, trying to um, all study together. Because by that point, like I, I've noticed that a lot of my residents are really familiar with both the people in my hall and the people in my uh, co-RA's hall, which is still part of Fabulous. But um, like, there's just I would say there's a lot of uh, a lot of off time, mm -hmm. but also a lot of uh, work time mm -hmm. that people will put in together. Yeah, and it's really nice because we're all freshmen and it's a freshman only hall. And so you're pretty much taking the same classes and like there's going to be some differences in your math classes or your chem or whatever because of based on like AP credits or anything that you came in with. Um, but it is an all freshman hall. So you can, I mean, you most, I think all residents that live in it take the honors 1150 class and they like most people are in at least some form of calc or are in chem or physics and so then you can like go into the kitchen and be like hey does anyone know how to help me with chem one i'm really struggling with this and then people can be like i can or no i haven't done that either let's work on it together which is really nice anything else that we should know about the hall that you can think of it's a great community. <laughs> it's really fun to live in. And like, again, my closest group of friends is from the hall. And so it served as a way for me to like get to know people and form connections that I might not have formed otherwise. So I think Elise will turn it to you for, for a minute. Um, so you're on kind of the other end of the spectrum. You're a Pavlis graduate. Um, how do you think how did you use your skills during the interview process as you were looking at med schools and how do you think you'll use those skills in the future? Yeah, um, so I think that like the skills that I um, have gained as a Pablo student like definitely shined during my interviews um, and a lot of the um, experiences that I had as a um, Pablo student were the things that I was talking about during my interviews um, so my immersion experience, my honors project, those were like really big things um, in my whole interview process um, and postgraduate life. Um, but yeah, it's, it has like made a huge impact on me. Um, and for me personally, I think it's a lot about getting outside of my comfort zone. So um, the amount of like speaking engagements that I've had to do as an honors student is just like crazy to me. Um, and, and coming in as a freshman, like I was mortified of speaking in public, um, but it has like on, it has allowed me so many opportunities. And um, with this kind of supportive community that we're all talking about here, it feels really safe to go outside of your comfort zone almost. Um, Cause you know that you are surrounded by people that will lift you up and support you. Um, so it doesn't feel so scary to do things that you might not have thought of doing before. Like um, for me, one of the big things was starting my own program and recruiting volunteers and running this program. 
um, and being the leader and, and speaking in front of big crowds. Um, so that wasn't something that I expected to do going in, um, but the skills that I've gained have allowed me to do stuff like that. Um, anything else that you think that we should know that I didn't cover? In that case, everybody that is watching tonight, do you have any questions? Um, if you do, feel free to type them up in the chat window and I'll take a look and I will ask our crowd or I'll answer them myself if I can. Should I talk a little bit about the 1150 class? Sure, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that would be okay. great. Um, so I, I think I'm the only person who's taken, did you take 1150? <laughs> okay, I'm the only person out of these three who has taken um, the 1150 class. So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's a one credit class. Um, I took it my fall semester, so last semester. Um, and it's pretty much all pre-admit students. Um, and then if people decide that they want, they are interested in Pavlis, don't really know, they can also join it. Um, so it's, again, one credit. So it's, I think, like one and a half hours every week. Um, and then you do like a reflection every week. Um, and the big focus is on what even is Pavlis and helping people decide whether or not they want to continue and actually become a Pavlis full student. Um, and then also learning about the design thinking process and then focusing on different like mindsets. So like the growth versus fixed mindset and how to shift your point of view so that you are more accepting of everyone and more less fixed on one thing so more developing towards the growth mindset which then also goes back to the design thinking process and the creativity behind that and how to get everything with that so it's not that bad of a class again hour and a half a week plus a little bit of time for the reflections and you just you go you meet some people because they're all honor students. A lot of them live in the LLC. So you just kind of form those connections and you have a fun time in class and then you are done and it's good. So looking at some of the questions that came in, I'm just gonna start at the top. Um, Andrea says, can you talk about study abroad? Does the program help with costs for study abroad? Um, I can talk to that a little bit. So Pavlis Honors College as a whole, um, if you think of the Honors College, like the College of Engineering as an administrative hub that has a lot of things underneath it, um, we do in fact house the study abroad program as one of the things under our umbrella. In fact, the head of the uh, study abroad program shares an office with me, which is nice. Um, so the program does, Palace specifically doesn't help with costs for study abroad, but we are the place to go to learn more about study abroad. Um, so unfortunately, my best thing to say is talk to Vienna, who is my office mate. Um, if you go to, I believe it's mtu.edu slash study abroad, she would be able to, or you should be able to get some more information on that. And, um, and the office specifically, Vienna would be able to, to help you out with that. Um, I might be wrong here, but yes. I think that for um, some of the global pathways, there are scholarships that you could maybe apply for. So yes. Yeah. And some of the, that's something that's changed. Um, we used to have a thing called the Global Leadership Program or Pathway, um, which we realized was a little bit restrictive because if you join the Global Leadership Pathway, you would get to travel abroad for about six weeks, but it also very much restricted you in your timeline and it kept you with the same cohort of people. So we are in the future planning on just having a leadership pathway and then being able to add global elements to any given pathway. So that could be something like if you're in the entrepreneurship pathway, you could learn about, you could do an internship in Europe, let's say, or if you are an innovator, you could do a pitch your innovation competition overseas, that sort of thing. So we're working all the time on figuring out ways that we can increase the amount of study abroad and also with ways that we can help fund it because we realize it's a very valuable experience, but also it's something that is not necessarily accessible to everybody. Um, so next question is, what do you all do for fun? Lots of academic talk, but can you sell us on the other activities <laughs> up there? This doesn't have to be honors. This can just be you guys. Oh, oh, you. I, I'd love to uh, approach this question head on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Matt, we actually had three broomball teams come from our halls alone, uh, which is about 30-ish people. Um, 
as Jordan mentioned, we did have a bi-weekly movie night or hangout night that we had in the kitchenette where uh, the RAs of the hall would rent out um, projectors. And I think at one point we wanted to have a, a Smash, like uh, not Smash, but like Super Smash Bros tournament uh, through the projectors. Um, there's a lot of people who are involved in the ROTC program up here. Um, uh, we have football players in our halls. Um, there's also like IM sports, um, there's Greek life. There's so many different ways to not only get involved on campus, but also find like uh, your niche and stuff. So like uh, when I first came to the hall, I wasn't really like an active person, but I ended up picking up uh, classes like the fundamentals, fundamentals of laser tag, uh, <laughs> playing broom ball like three times a week through a class and through one of the teams. So uh, I would say there's a lot of different ways that you can have fun up here that don't have to do with, you know, studying with your friends or doing homework or putting on music in the background. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a ton of clubs up here and some are more <sighs> academic focused like the lots of different engineering societies and stuff like that um but then there's a lot of clubs that might have five to ten people because that's who's excuse me who's interested in it so like for example i'm in engineering world health which is focused on engineering world health you know creating different things that could help global health rather than just Michigan-centered health or U.S.-centered health or something like that. Um, and it's open to all majors, even though it seems more biomedical. Um, but there's only usually, technically, there's like 100 people in it, but only like five to 10 people show up each time. <laughs> and so like you get that group of people that you can like, you know, and like whatever, and it's fun. Um, and then there's also tons of other smaller or larger clubs um but then you once you have your group of friends you can kind of do whatever you want like you can host a movie night whether that's in your kitchenette or watching it on a laptop in someone's room or you can go and you can walk around campus um the falls up here are gorgeous um and so you can do so much because it's beautiful outside um and yeah you just kind of do whatever you want and it's as long as it's legal <laughs> and it's fun <laughs> um yeah i can i can speak to what i do for fun um so um when i was a student i was um in the tennis club um and i was in the orchestra so there's like so many things on campus to get involved in so many diverse interests and if you don't know how to do something yet but you want to do it we have like literally the most vast array i think of pe classes you can literally learn to do whatever sport or whatever skill you want to learn um including things like laser tag and bowling and all sorts of things um and um, yeah, there's literally no shortage of things to do outside. Um, so personally, I am like, when I wasn't in class, I wanted to be outside. So in the winter, I was downhill skiing, cross country skiing. Um, in the summer, I'll be running, hiking. Um, yeah, just like really soaking in the beauty of this peninsula because it is truly beautiful. I think one thing that, a quick thing that I'll add to is one of the nice things about Michigan Tech size is that we have enough people to make it fun, but we don't have so many people focused on any one given thing that it's exclusionary. Um, you know, for example, if you're into choir or orchestra or musical theater, or, you know, something artistic, um, it's possible for you to audition for the school musical or be in, in a performing arts uh, type thing and not have to worry about, well, the, there are people that are majoring in theater or music performance and they're going to get the slots. Um, so you can try something and if you like it, great, then you have a new thing to do for four years. And if you don't like it, okay, no harm, no foul. You know, what's the next thing? What's laser tag or broom ball or 35 miles of ski trails or downhill skiing or, or whatever you want to do. Yeah, that's, that's, kind of that's definitely a really good point. Um, I like, yeah, being in an orchestra in college, um, uh, definitely not common for someone that's not like a music major. Um, and then even like being in tennis club, 
Um, we traveled for tournaments um, and at some of the bigger schools, like if you weren't good enough, like you would not be on the team, you wouldn't be traveling for tournaments. Um, so it's really nice because you can get involved in things and kind of like a more laid back way. You do not need to be um, like on the cusp of being a professional in order to get involved in things. Um, you can just be an amateur hobbyist, um, which is what I am in like three million things. Um, I call myself like a recreationalist because I just love doing so many different things. Um, and, and yeah, Michigan Tech allows you to do that because there aren't like 5,000 people competing for one spot. So next up we have, does Pavlis allow you to start doing research through the research pathway sooner than you would be able to regularly? So, um, as I mentioned before, I am in the research scholars pathway. Um, and I would say yes. Uh, I actually managed to get into a research lab in my first semester here at Michigan Tech. I uh, applied for the undergraduate research internship program scholarship, which is the Europe scholarship. But um, if you talk to any of your mentors or anyone here at Pavlis, they can direct you to someone who might be interested in your field of research. Like I, uh, when I officially became part of the research scholars, I was like, I want to find a way to help uh, fight cancer. And so um, what I did was I had a meeting with um, Dr. Meadows, the Dean of Pavlis, and I said, here are my interests, here's what I wanna do, how do I get involved? And what she actually did was send out, send out an email to different professors who had interests in those um, fields, and I got connected with Dr. Feng Xiao, who was actually, who is actually studying like stem, stem cell tissue engineering. So, it, yeah. So like, <laughs> yes, it is true. <laughs> it's really <laughs> cool. <laughs> but, um, so just identifying what you're interested in and reaching out, those are the two biggest things to getting into research. And yes, yes, you can get involved sooner rather than later, I would say. I, um, I also got involved with a research lab, technically my first semester, but I'm getting more involved now this semester. Um, and I found this, my lab, because of the seminar class that I had because of my major. And not all majors have it, but I know that biomed, environmental engineers, civil engineers, chemical engineers, material science, eh, kind of material science engineers, um, they, a lot of the engineering at least have a seminar class that you get introduced to what your major is and everything like that. And so through that, we had a lot of different professors come in and talk about what the research was. And I, one of the researchers or one of the professors came in and I listened to his research and I'm like, that is cool. That is what I want to do with my life. I want to like, I want to work in his lab. Um, and so I emailed him and was just like, Hey, I'd love to work in your lab. I have a little bit of research experience from high school. Can I work in your lab? And he's like, yeah, come talk to me. We'll, you know, we'll talk about it. And so I went and talked to him and I am now working in his lab. So I think that Pavlis definitely can help, but then you can also find it through different ways if you decide not to do Pavlis or you want to do it separate from Pathways. Yeah, I didn't um, start in like a regular research position until um, like the end of my second year. Um, but I think a big reason for that was that I did not ask for anything. Um, and I was like emailing professors, but it was on my own and I wasn't really making the right connections. Um, so yeah, I think that it, and since now um, having this like 1150 and pre-admission, um, you get like integrated into the community a lot quicker. Um, so yeah, I do think it would definitely open doors for you. Um, you just need to make sure you're like asking for it. So you want to go um, early and, and seek out people that um, in the Honors College that might be able to connect you with those resources. Because, um, yeah, as someone that maybe should have asked a little bit sooner, I can definitely say that um, the, the connections that I know that all of the um, advisors and instructors and professors in the Honors College have um, would have opened doors for me. Okay, next question. 
Is it hard to balance everything? Clubs, honor stuff, classes, etc. Um, it it can be. It it really can be. Um, but if you acknowledge that you want to participate in a lot of things, I, I think that's the most important step. And also trying to find time for everything whether you're laying out your schedule in a planner or on Google Calendar or anything like that, just uh, managing your own time is probably the most important skill you're gonna learn at college, aside from like, I don't know, rocket science. So uh, <laughs> I would just, I would say it can be if you're not aware and actively working to uh, like, I don't know, manage your time more effectively. But um, I don't know, there's also a lot of people here who are honestly gonna be procrastinating assignments or <laughs> doing their own thing or joining so many clubs that they don't know how to count anymore. So it, I think what do you guys should try to do? Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> for me personally, I didn't, there was only like, I could only probably like count on my fingers, like the number of times that I truly felt like overwhelmed. Um, I think in general, um, if you are balancing things and you're not making sure you're overextending yourself and burning the candle at both ends um, every single night um, and you're eating well and you're sleeping, I don't think that um, doing a reasonable amount of activities plus your classes is crazy. Um, obviously, there will be times when you have three exams in one day um, and you have to kind of stay up a little later the night before and suddenly there's something that you need to do for your club and you just became the treasurer and there's six things you have to do for that. Um, so those things definitely happen, but I think those are like few and far between compared to the times um, that if you are taking care of yourself and balancing your um, life and balancing your schedule that um, things will kind of feel calm for most of the time. And that's what I experienced personally. Yeah, I think that your first semester, even if you're really great at time management is just gonna be just a little chaotic, just as you're getting into the feel of college, cause it is different than high school and everything like that. And so I think that it's gonna be chaotic, but you pretty much, it's pretty easy to fall into like the schedule of what everything is after your first couple weeks and there's you can decide which clubs you want to be in pretty much any time throughout the semester because like no club is going to be like no you didn't come to that first meeting so you can't be here right like you can kind of be like oh this club sounds really interesting but it's november oh well i'll join now um or if you're really worried about it you could wait till the semester but like no it's not, it's not weird for people to like go to a club and then be like, I don't have time for this, sorry, and drop out or vice versa. Don't go to the club and then realize that you do have time for it and then go like, it's not a weird thing. Um, and so once you kind of get into that like schedule of what your classes, is, classes are, it's not that, it's, I mean, you do need to develop those time management skills, but you can kind of, tell like, oh, I can do something on Tuesday nights because I have most of Tuesday to work on my homework, but I can't do something on Wednesday nights because I have an 8 a.m. on Thursday and so I can't stay up really late or whatever. Yeah, and I think you also learn um, what you like in terms of like scheduling probably after your first semester. I know I personally um, took an 8 a.m. my first semester, my first year, and I never took an 8 a.m. ever again. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, you 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 get in the groove and you figure out what works for you, um, and you find out your favorite study spot and where you work the best and your favorite learning center coach. Um, and yeah, things just end up working out somehow. So it looks like we have one more question. Um, any honor student, also athletes that can speak about their experience? Um, I don't know, are any of you student athletes? I know that there are several student athletes in the LLC and also some ROTC members. It seems like they juggle okay. Yeah, um, like uh, 
in terms of being their RA, I've seen uh, a lot of different reactions to how people have been balancing their interests with their academics with um, being athletes and stuff. I would say you're already like showing how ambitious and dedicated you are to a sport by being an athlete. Um, by joining the Honors College, you're also just trying to improve yourself like uh, emotionally and like uh, kind of like interpersonally. So I would say, again, it really kind of depends on who you are as a person and like how much time you're willing to put into everything. I would say they balance it fine. I mean, uh, we've got football players in our hall. We've also got a few people who are in the ROTC program up here at Michigan Tech. And so it's, uh, they seem to balance it pretty fine. Yeah, yeah I think the um, honors program in general like gives you some really great skills to deal with difficult, tough stuff. Um, including um, the difficult things that show up in college. Um, so in terms of like adding a burden to your plate, I don't think it does that. I think it only enhances your experiences um, and gives you a community that you can lean on when you are having like difficult times. Um, so I think that's really important. Yeah, I think potentially the difference between being an athlete or being not an athlete, like, I'm not an athlete, so like I can't. I this is just what I've known from talking to people who are. So like, <laughs> don't take this, <laughs> don't take this super seriously. But I think that the difference is just like where you're going to be dedicating your time. So like, for me as a non-athlete, I might be dedicating my time more to hanging out with my friends in the kitchenette and watching movies, whereas someone who's an athlete or going to different clubs or whatever someone as an athlete might be dedicating more of their time to hanging out with all of their athlete friends in their sport. Um, and then obviously there's still going to be time for homework and stuff like that, but there's going to be less time where you can do a lot of different things. And it's more of, you have this one thing plus these other clubs, but it's, you don't have as much time to dedicate to everything you want to do. Yeah, I, it sound bad, I mean, so I, I'm not going to call myself a student athlete by any means whatsoever, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, um, because I was in tennis club um, and we had practices three times a week for a couple hours, which is well, well below what the commitment for a true student athlete is. Um, but for me personally, like whenever we traveled for tournaments and things, it was not, um, I didn't feel like things were like going out of control. You just, you make sure that you're getting things done on time, getting things done early. Um, and professors are always willing to work with students to, um, and obviously like athletes have a lot of accommodations in terms of getting work early um, and exam accommodations. So, um, and that goes for actually everyone. Um, professors are always willing to work with you. Um, and the Dean of Students here is extremely helpful um, for accommodations. Um, that you may need. So there's always people that are available to help you. Um, so I don't think that um, for anyone on campus that there's ever not resources that they can use. And I'm neither an athlete nor a student, <laughs> but anecdotally something that we've heard from a number of our students that either have very rig rigorous course curriculums or a, some sort of big commitment, whether that's as athletes or ROTC or jobs or what have you. Um, a lot of people say that the element of the Pavlis classes of reflection, um, it can kind of be a nice relief because it makes you focus on yourself for a little bit and what you are enjoying and what you want to do. Um, I think it's kind of easy just to put your head down and get done what you need to do for class and then what you need to do for your job or your athletics or whatever your big other thing is and then go to sleep and then open your eyes and do it again. And um, a lot of the honors curriculum, since it's so customized and so personal, is a chance to take a minute and stop and breathe and say, okay, you know, I've got to get all of these checklists done, but also I need to check in with myself and figure out what do I like to do, what do I want to do in the future, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a nice excuse just to say, hey, I'm doing it all for the team, doing it all for my major, what am I doing for me today, which is kind of handy. 
yeah the the seminar courses and like honors college events in general are like definitely a form of self-care that you can use in college um because you are like talking about things um that are important to you your values like you are um working on yourself while you're in these classes um and that can be really helpful for everyone whether you're an athlete or um you're in research or whatever it may be so it looks like that wraps it up for questions and I've got to get you all back to studying and everything else that you're doing with your busy time. So anybody else have anything you want to say before we wrap it up? Thanks for listening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Um, just as a, a reminder, if you're interested in the pre-admissions program, go to mtu.edu slash honors. Um, there's a big button right on the homepage that says for incoming first year students. If you have any questions about Pavlis, email me. I'm uh, Becky Bernard. I'm honors at mtu.edu, or there's a contact form down at the bottom of the website. Um, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. You told a thousand things that I never could, so really, really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody out there. We will be recording this, at, or saving the recording, putting it on our website, and I think on our Facebook page. So look for that, too, if you have any questions. And I think that's it. So thanks. Good night. Good night. Hi. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs>